That's it. All right, here is the outline. Uh, so I'm gonna, you know, provide you some motivation, introduction, you know, what we measuring and why do we measure? And I'm gonna give some examples from our, uh, you know, recent uh, projects uh, related to satellites, related to drones. Um, and then I'm gonna have at the end, you know, my final remarks and the, you know, future perspective where this research is really going. So this is sort of the outline of my talk. So I just want to start with some, you know, recent headlines, uh, you know, past couple of weeks and particularly, you know, past week as well. So if you look at the, the last week of August, uh, there's a headline at Fox News. It says, FEMA administrator on Gulf one to two storm punch never had this circumstance before in recent history. If you look at the, the CNN uh, on September 14, five cyclone, uh, tropical cyclones are in the Atlantic at the same time for only the second time in the history. If you look at the right side uh, from Forbes, uh, largest wildfire in California history, now up to eight, eight plus hundred acres burn, and only you know one third of that contained. So the common word, you know, all this headline, by the way, these all happened like in the past month, past, past week and past month. And the common word in all of those are the history. So these are all history making uh, events just happening very recently. Um, and also one of the common uh, between all of those are the water. Either you have too much water or you have a little water, right? So in case of hurricane, you have too much air, uh, the uh, water vapor, right? In the air um, and, and in case of forest fires, it's just the lack of uh, the water, so it's just the drought conditions. And of course, this is gonna, you know, provide a lot of hardships on farmers as well. The climate change, you know, the you know lack of water or too much water. Let's just look at the just to understand the soil a little bit more. So you can think of the soil like a sponge. So it has a lot of uh, gaps in between. And then, you know, depending on how much water you have, those gaps were filled with water, right? So you might have a little water, so we call that drought, right? And then if you have too much water, so it causes uh, 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 flooding. So the, the one on the left that you're seeing is, is event uh, happened when I started at Mississippi State. That was November 2016. So I used to live uh, in Washington, D.C. area. So it's relatively higher, you know, latitude compared to here. So when I came here, you know, everybody's saying the south is, you know, hot, humid, and you know, I came here in the August uh, time frame, and it became September, it became October. Still, the temperatures are above 90. So I thought, you know, maybe um, it's really the hot, but it wasn't really the case. So now you can see that we have hot weathers and cold weathers, or like in between. Uh, but what happened in November was is a drought a condition. So it was a really a severe or extreme drought happened in 2016. And this year in February, uh, you know, January, February, if you recall, we had too much rain. Uh, and you can see here on the screen uh, is a screenshot from a local TV. It's showing the flooding causes evacuation and road closures. This is near the, uh, the Pearl, Pearl River near Jackson. So obviously, too little and too much, both of them are, is really uh, dangerous and it's not desirable. And as the climate change, you know, uh, continues, so those things happen more frequently. And like I showed you in the previous slide, it's really those historic events just happen in, in less than a month, uh, just near, uh, near time. Um, so, uh, the, so how we can really cope with the, the climate change or, or such problems? Of course, the, like I said, the common ingredient is the, the water, right? So we need to track the, the water. So how can we track the water? We can use satellites or we can use, you know, low-cost uh, sensing instruments like the drones or, you know, something closer to the, the ground. Well, the satellites, for example, here you see the A, which is the uh, SMAP satellite. Uh, you know, it, it provides you global soil moisture product every two to three days. So particularly, it's providing a view of how the whole Earth system works. That's great to understand the climate, but it's not good enough for the farmers. It's not good enough for individuals. 
uh, because the resolution is usually either the spatial resolution or the temporal resolution is coarse. It's not fine enough to really understand what is going on in your backyard. So what you need to do is you have to have an instrument or platform that should be closer to the ground. And that should be also available uh, to the you know, largely agricultural based society so that they can uh, really use that sort of technology in their backyard, in their farms. So the solution, well, uh, could be a microwave oven, right? So this is uh, almost everyone has in their kitchen. This micro is the, the one that I have in my kitchen. So I took the picture in my home. Uh, the, the basic idea for the uh, microwave oven is it uses a microwave radiation to warm the food by making the water molecules vibrate at 2.45 gigahertz. So the frequency well uh let's you know just went to the uh, take the tape measure i want to measure the uh the length of that uh, cooking cavity and it's about like 16.5 uh, inches and i know i'm electrically i'm a an electromagnetic uh, instructor as well so i know that electric field should be uh, on the walls uh, you know, due to the boundary condition should equal to be zero so you have to be only fitting some sinusoidal so the that distance is not really accidental. That has to be a multiple of half wavelengths. And uh, when I look at, uh, uh, you know, measure it, and I can fit here like the seven half wavelengths, and and half wavelength is around twelve centimeters. If I go ahead, you know, just very simple equation: frequency equal to speed of light divided wavelength. I can roughly figure out the frequency of operating frequency of, for this microwave oven. So it operates at two point five gigahertz. But in reality, it's 2.45. So my estimate is not really bad. Um, but the, the key takeaway message from this slide is that the microwave frequencies, the wavelength is around you know, centimeter level, sometimes meter level, but mostly centimeter level. But those frequencies are highly uh, you know, um, sensitive to the water. And particularly, this 2.5 gigahertz is the one that resonates with the water molecules. So this is how. Uh, the microwave oven really operates. So the microwave frequencies could be a solution uh, in microwave, not the microwave oven, but the microwave frequencies could be a solution because it's very sensitive to water. So for example, what is this? Uh, this is, you know, you can see it's food, but if from a scientific perspective, you can just say this is a mixture. So mixture of many different materials. It's like the soil. So in the soil, you have uh, you know, clay, you have loam, you have sand, and you have air gaps, and then you have water. So it's just a mixture of many different things, right? It's like your microwave oven. So it is basically um, contains some, you know, the, 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 it has water, so it has some sensitivity to the microwave frequencies. So the main driver of the dielectric constant of the natural materials um, uh, is at the microwave frequency range is, is the water. That water could be in liquid phase, you know, solid phase or gas phase. You, know, you may have fresh water, seawater, dry soil, wet soil, snowflakes, dry snow, wet snow, ice, water. So all of those have some sort of sensitivity to microwave signals. So in this talk, we're particularly interested in dry soil and wet soil. So if you look at the, the figure on the right, this is the angle uh, versus reflectivity. And at different polarization, horizontal and vertical polarization, and we have three different cases here, dry soil, wet soil, and water. And the dielectric constant is, is quite distinct between different type of dry soil, wet soil, and water. And their reflectivity responses are also quite you know, different. So basically, this is the sensitivity that we use. This, this is the dynamic range that we use in microwave remote sensing to really sense the amount of water, amount of water in the soil. And this is known. This is not something that you know I'm telling you now that I invented. This is known at least 30, 40 years, maybe more, right? And this is an area we've been studying for a long time. So the microwave remote sensing basically goes from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. It could be a passive. It's like your IR camera that you're not sending anything. You're just, you know, uh, just receiving the uh, uh, the natural uh, emission coming from the, the the objects. So that's the radiometer passive. You're not sending anything. On the one in the middle is the active. It's like your um, 
and you know the police radar so it transmits and receives back and the last one is the signals of opportunity uh, which has also transmitter and receiver but they are well separated from each other and the transmit you know transmis uh, transmitter is particularly uh, are the free sources which I'll talk about in this uh, presentation um, so this is basically like the three different techniques that we use in microremote sensing to sense the water in the soil and and the, the last one the signals opportunity is sort of the the technique is is developing you know uh, and getting much more attention which i'll explain why it is so but it's getting much more attention within the hydrology community uh to uh use it because there are a lot of advantages of using that so and this topic mostly be focusing on the, the signals of opportunity before you know going into those details i just want to highlight some differences and similarities between what exists in precision agriculture and what we can do for precision agriculture so in currently, uh, in the precision agriculture, either using a visible portion of the spectrum or infrared portion of the spectrum, uh, like, like seen in here, uh, either you depend on the sun, if the sun is illuminating and that reflects, your camera is you know, collecting the reflected signal, we call that reflectance, or in case of like the IR camera, so you're just you know, recording the emitted signal. So this is... Uh, what you know in what sensor has been used in precision agriculture uh, so far but the one on the right is the signals of opportunity uh, the key well it's similar to uh, the reflectance so you have a source that reflects from the surface and then you have a receiver that receives that reflected signal it's like your camera right the sun reflects from the surface and then you you receive that signal the key difference is uh, the type and number of sources, penetration and the spectrum diversity. So in the case of camera, you have the sun, that's the source of illumination. But in case of signals of opportunity, source of illumination are the satellite. That could be GNSS satellite, like the GPS, uh, could be communication satellites, uh, could be uh, radio signals like the, the XM radio or, you know, uh, direct TV. So there are a lot of different satellites already exist for their own purposes, radiating, illuminating the earth. So you're building a receiver, that receiver collects that reflected signal and, and that we call that reflectivity. So this is, you can see that there are more sources. So in case of uh, camera, you have only one source, but in case of signals of opportunity, you have thousands of satellite transmitting. So you have thousands of sun operating day and night. So uh, that's also another uh, important property. And also the microwave signals can penetrate through the vegetation and even can penetrate through the, the soil. Uh, but it depends on the wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, so it has a better penetration, so higher the wavelength, it doesn't. So, so the idea here is um, how can we leverage those uh, existing infrastructure, space infrastructure, and turn that into a remote sensing uh, uh, sensor? How can we do those, right? So this is the question. I'm going to give you a typical example here. GNSS reflectometry, uh, or widely known as uh, uh navigation signals right so in navigation signals in theory the, the purpose of the navigation is you want to know where you are right so the x y z is the location uh, your location in space and also there's a, some clock bias between the you know this the gps satellites and and your device so there are like four unknowns and if i have four gps satellites are visible to me and basically i can have four equation and i can solve this four equation i can get the uh, uh you know locate where i am right that's the purpose of the uh, navigation gps satellites but in reality that's the ideal world but in reality there are a lot of uh, source of errors that signal has to go through the atmosphere ionosphere and also that signal is, does, doesn't come to you directly but also come through reflecting from the surface right and if you look at the, the gnss constellations there are GPS from US, uh, GLONASS from Russia, Galileo from Europe, and Beta from China. So like more than 100 GPS satellites are orbiting around the world. These are, you can think of like hundreds sun around, er, er, orbiting around the, the Earth. Uh, of course, the, not all of them are visible to you, but at least you're going to have 30 or 40 of them will be visible. So um, 
So again, these multipath atmosphere and ionosphere are source of errors. They're not really desirable. But those are source of information as well. So if you have a wet surface, so the multipath will be higher. If you have a dry surface, it's gonna be less multipath you're going to have. So we can basically turn this uh, source of error into opportunity. But if you are stationary, so you can just learn what's going on around you perhaps, right? But think about it that you put that instrument you know, in a moving platform, a drone, or you can put in a small satellite. I call it small satellite and drone because you have just a receiver. Transmitter portion of that is already built for you. You don't have to really spend any penny on that, even though that's made from the taxpayer's money. But nonetheless, it's you don't do it, you don't pay it directly. So the transmitter is already exist, but the receiver is the one that you're building. Usually the, the smaller and cheapest requires less power. And if this platform is really moving, those multipath points, we call it specular points or the Fresnel zones, they're also moving with you. So think about it like in the previous slide, I talked about you have 30 satellite visible. So that means you have 30 different points coming from the ground. And as you move, you are scanning a very large area. So that's the, the power of uh, you know, GNSSR. And NASA you know, um, uh, became aware of this, uh, uh, you know, the power. And so they invested on the, uh, you know, this sort of technology. In 2016, late 2016, NASA launched a mission called Cyclone Genesis Mission. And this mission is consists of eight microsatellites. You can see one of them here on the left top corner. And there are eight of them are flying in formation uh, in the low Earth orbit, orbit. And they're primarily orbiting around the tropics because this mission is dedicated to the ocean. They want to understand the wind speed. They want to understand how the hurricane forms and how the hurricanes, you know, uh, evolve over time. So that's the purpose of the uh, the Cygnus mission. But you can see that the Cygnus is an ocean mission, but the coverage over land is also substantial. Almost all Africa and you know, almost you know, part of the South America, large part of the South America, part of the North America, you know, uh, Australia, part of the Asia is already within the coverage. But the, the mission is not required to really look into the data over land. They're just required to look, they're designed to look at the ocean winds. And then, you know, we, we said, can we turn this into an opportunity? How about the data over the land? Can we use that information and turn into the, uh, turn into the, um, can we use that data, can we turn that into an information, particularly the soil moisture? Well, the reason for that is the GPS satellite is operating in L-band, which is a microwave frequency of 1.5 giga, gigahertz. And that frequency is, is highly sensitive to the water in the soil. And this is the same technology or same frequency uh, or similar frequency that's used by a NASA Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission, which is about a billion dollar and based on like 40, 30 years of development history. But the problem with that is over land. Land is much difficult than the ocean. The land, you have uh, signals, may, we may have like, coherent, incoherent signals, the topography can play a role, surface roughness, land cover, soil moisture, soil texture, the configuration of the satellites, bistatic geometry, and everything. A lot of you know, factors here can play what you receive. So you have to develop a very complicated model to take into account all these variations and then resolve and get the soil moisture out of it. It's a very difficult problem here. So uh, it's a complex uh, you know, uh, relationship between what you're measuring and what you want to estimate. And the physics models is, is, is really, uh, it has to be very advanced to do that, which is not the case you know, currently. So what we said, all right, why don't we use machine learning and you know to leverage that the 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 machine learning's power of you know the estimation of the nonlinear relationship between input and output. So in 2019, uh, one of my students got a NASA uh, Space Science Fellowship program. Uh, to exactly what I just described, you want to understand the land data land signatures of the Cygnus, and want to turn that into the soil moisture. Um, and, you know, he, he worked on, he and I work on that, and we published a paper 
uh, that was in 2019. Uh, the title of this paper is High Spatial Temporal Resolution Signal Soil Moisture Estimates Using Artificial Neural Network. So at the time, we just used the artificial neural network, and we only used 18 uh, international soil moisture networks for our ground truth uh, purposes. That was sort of a proof of concept. We said the machine learning can be used for these purposes, but it was very limited data set, and it just can be considered as the proof of concept. And then he graduated, so our team extended. So uh, Dr. Wolkan, Dr. Fengli, for, they now work at uh, GRI, so they joined our team. Uh, and then we said, well, why don't we continue on that work? And we had 18 sites. Let's just you know, use more than that. So we used 100 sites across the US, and then we train our model, not only uh, uh, neural networks, but also uh, SVM, we use uh, uh, random forest and that other uh, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms. And then we realized that the model that we develop is, is highly uh, generalizable. So we can really generalize that model, even though it's trained over only the US, but the US, it has a very uh, diverse you know, topography, very diverse vegetations as well. And with those hundred uh, sites, we, we, you know, we, we saw the, the, the future. We just said, well, this could be generalized. Why don't we apply it to the globally uh, and, and see how it performs? And then you know, we have just recent publications. Some of them are in review. Some of them are just accepted uh, that we develop a quasi global product. And of course, we have a product now you have to validate it. So we have to validate it with something independent source, which I'll talk about after this slide. Um, just a little bit talk about the, the machine learning algorithm that we use. So we call that physics aware because we're not providing an arbitrary inputs. We know the relationship. We know from the physics how the received signals are related to the earth properties. So we have to identify relevant input parameters and we have to input those to our machine learning algorithm and, and train the, the model right, over uh, these international soil moisture networks, which provide the true soil moisture. And with that, you have to do a lot of uh, you know, uh, maskings. You know, you know, the, the sickness doesn't work much about high elevation. Water is sort of, you know, if, if there's a standing water is contaminating the signal, but not contaminating, it's just you know, affecting, changing your signal quite a lot. And there's some you know, system related, um, uh, the parameters we have to take into account. So there are a lot of uh, the flagging that we have to develop to make sure the data is qual you know, good quality. And then we extended that to you know, 100 to 170 ISMSI. And then we apply this, and then we realized that the random force is the, the best among the other machine learning algorithms. And then we apply that to you know, global and everywhere on Earth, well, not everywhere, within the coverage of the, the Cygnus. So the one on the right is what the, the primary objective of the Cygnus, which provides the wind speed uh, over the ocean. The one on the left is the product that we develop, as you're seeing this a sample, provides you the soil moisture map globally. And we call this soil moisture product uh, MSU, GRI, so surface soil moisture product, um, and uh, now, like I said, uh, we are uh, doing sort of a double opportunity. Remember, the GPS satellite is used for the navigation, and Cygnus is developed for the ocean. And now we're using the GPS Cygnus for land surface. So this is like a double opportunity that here that we develop a nine kilometer uh, Cygnus soil moisture maps um, every day. And you can see the sample on the left right here. But like I said, how are we going to compare? So this with the, you know, how are we gonna show that what we're doing is the, the truth or how, how good it is, right? So we have to compare with uh, something sort of considered to be uh, the uh, state of the art, which is the SMAP soil moisture. SMAP is specifically developed for, uh, you know, soil moisture development across the globe every two to three days from South Pole to North Pole, so everywhere. But here I put, uh, you know, we put here uh, some regional, I want to give you some regional examples. So the boxes here going to show you, compare the SMAP and Cygnus. We have a qu quantitative comparison as well, but the visual comparison are usually much more powerful uh, to show how it works. So those boxes are the regional areas like the, you know, um, uh, Northeast, 
uh, Sahara region, India, or Australia. So the one on the right, that's the, you can see the India region. Uh, we have nine kilometer by nine kilometer uh, signal soil moisture product. You can see the, the one on the left. The one on the middle is the, what the SMAP is, is producing. And uh, those you know, small boxes, which I'll show you later, more detailed, uh, but the small boxes that you're seeing in here is this, uh, some sub-regions among those regions. And you can basically see a lot of more, uh, more detail with the signal soil moisture than the SMAP uh, soil moisture, because the resolution is, is much better. Uh, you have like the three kilometer by three kilometer resolution, uh, and then nine kilometer by nine kilometer resolution. And also you can see here is the uh, temporal evaluation of our uh, soil moisture product against the SMAP uh, as a function of time. So it, you know, this is when the, the, the March 2017 is when the SMAP, uh, the sickness was, data was available and then we're comparing with the, the SMAP data. You can see that the correlation is like 83 percentage um, and uh, the, the wet read, seasons, like the monsoon uh, seasons, uh, we sort of underestimating and SMAP is sort of, you know, overestimating. Uh, and, but the rest of the time, they're matching each other pretty well. And we know sort of why they're not matching well, you know, during the monsoon season, because the SMAP footprint is quite large. And, and you know, standing water is also mixed with the soil moisture. Uh, and their you know, estimation is, is much wetter compared to us because our methodology signals, we sort of eliminating the standing water and we just finding the soil moisture around the, the you know, seasonal water area as well. So we sort of explain those differences, but the good thing is uh, both spatially and temporally, uh, they're very well correlated with each other. So this is from India. So this is from Midwest. And this is from you know Sahara, you know to the this tropical region. So uh, you know you have the desert area, and then you have this you know tropical region. So you, this sort of a transition uh, area. And this is from the the Australia. So it's pretty good, you know. Uh, you know, comp you know when you compare the SMAP, which is the state of the art, and compare with our product, uh, looks very good spatial and temporal uh, correlation. Uh, between each other. And it's an, another close up uh, example that you're seeing in here. Uh, the, the one on the top left is Cygnus 9 kilometer estimates. Uh, the one on the left bottom is Cygnus 3 kilometer. The one on the top right is SMAP 9 kilometer. The one on the, uh, the bottom right is a SMAP 36 36 uh, soil moisture. Obviously, Cygnus has a much better resolution. Uh, of course, it's not really perfect. I'm not going to say that the signals data product is much better. What I'm just saying is it provides a lot of uh, details, which doesn't uh, not able to resolve by the SMAP itself. All right, so that's the, the machine learning portion. That's the signals data that we use. But ultimately, really, to, to in order for the machine learning really to make sense, you need to understand the, the underlying physics. So we have also a lot of work going on uh, relate the models. So um, the, what you're measuring is, like I said, in the case of Cygnus, it, it's based on a lot of system parameters. It based on a lot of target parameters and and also the parameter that you interest. So we develop forward models to understand these relationships. But at the end, we have to simplify those models and get the you know the the inversion, which is you you retrieve the information that you want from the data. And these are like the R electromagnetic models. Like you know, we have to simplify the scenes, the, like the deciduous tree, pine trees, so soybeans, corns. Uh, you know, from an electromagnetic perspective, from the microwave perspective, this is how it looked like uh, from uh, you know from that perspective. And we develop a model we call that SCABI, Signals of an Opportunity Coherent Biostatic Scattering Model, and we made it uh, freely available and open source it. Uh, because these models are very complicated and it, it's not easy to really develop this. It takes years to do, really develop these models. So we want to you know, share this with the community so that we can you know, have new collaborations uh, opens up. So this is freely available and it's a very comprehensive model that we develop. And here is some information. So it's available in GitHub and website. We also you know, develop some tutorials explaining how this model works. Let me just give you an example how we use that model. So this is a, one example that we have um, uh, that I want to show. 
So in this uh, um, the cartoon, that uh, diagram that you're seeing is the receiver and transmitter and looking at a cornfield, uh, which, which is a row structure. And we want to understand, you know, uh, how the receive signal is sensitive to vegetation water content, water in the vegetation, and we want to understand how much the soil moisture is contributing, how much the surface up. So that this is the beauty of the, the forward model. So you can vary these parameters and you can really quantify uh, those sensitivities. You can see that vegetation water contents like 6 dB is uh, contributing to your receive signal and the soil moisture is 6 dB, like the dry and wet soil moisture and the surface roughness is about 2 dB. When you sum all that, it's become like a 12 dB uh, dynamic range you can have. But of course, what you receive will be a blend of, you know, some, you will get a little bit from the vegetation water content, a little bit from the soil moisture, a little bit of roughness. So that makes it a little bit difficult to really decompose into, you know, the small pieces. So that's why we use this machine learning to separate those into small pieces and get the soil moisture information. But nonetheless, this is showing you, this is the GPS signals reflecting from a corn canopy over entire growth period. And you can see that there's a like 12 dB dynamic range that you can expect to see. Uh, and this is based on our simulations. And also this is something that we want to extend in the future uh, that, you know, that, that model that we developed was based on a flat surface, but we want to add some topographic informations. And we want to add, you know, the satellite geometry uh, and uh, and move it, make a, a simulator software so that we can uh, simulate a small satellite, uh, new semester, small satellite that perhaps will be launched in the future. Before they launch, you you develop such simulators to understand what parameters are need to be considered before you really building those satellites. So this is under development; it's not finished yet, um, but hope to you know uh, finish this in the fe near future. So this is another topic related to soil moisture root zone. So the GPS signals are L-band, which is just provide you five centimeter penetration. Um, so uh, root zone is, is defined as the, the soil moisture content, you know, or top, top one meter layer. So obviously from a, you know, theoretical perspective, uh, you have to have a longer wavelength in order to, you know, penetrate into soil. Um, so, in order to understand this, so we got a project uh, under terrestrial hydrology program with Purdue University. Uh, so, the goal of the project is use I, P, and S bands. Those are different frequencies, low frequency, mid frequency, and a little bit higher frequency, and try to understand how can we leverage multiple frequencies uh, and, and can we get the, the moisture and deeper into the root zone. Because the current uh, GPS satellite is just going to give you the surface soil moisture. And we compare our model with the measurement in 2018. Uh, they look uh, pretty promising, uh, but of course, this is a preliminary result. Uh, we're still working on that, and we're trying to understand how can we really, uh, and this is the P-band result, but how can we really use multiple frequencies and all uh, to leverage those and then, you know, get the, the soil moisture at multiple depths. So this is something we're working on uh, under that project. And uh, because of the, uh, the, the community's uh, uh, really interest in the different frequencies, NASA awarded a new project, uh, the in-space validation of Earth, under in-space validation of Earth science technologies, uh, which is a small uh, technology demonstration CubeSat uh, project we are also part of this project, but not the, the technology part. We're, we're part of the, the validation of this uh, uh, the project. So this project is basically going to be uh, try to demonstrate that the P band uh, like the Cygnus, but this is the P band using the communication satellites. Uh, can we get the uh, reflectivity from a small satellite uh, from a low Earth orbit? So the Purdue is leading this effort. Uh, Goddard and JPL developing the the front and the back end. We are the using our SCOBY model, once the data is available, because it's going to be launched in 2021, we'll be validating their uh, product using our uh, model, SCOBY model. And also, before we're getting those uh, 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 that data, we're running a lot of uh, simulation with our SCOBY model to understand the physics further. So the question here is, like, how many measurements we need how many different frequencies, angles, and polarization we need to get the uh, the soil moisture at different depth values? So this is a the research question that we're working on. And recently, uh, uh, we you know they will, you know we submitted a new paper 
which is under review, we want to understand it, what is the camera lower bound for root zones remote sensing. Um, and you, here, I'm not going to really go into details of these figures, but we're looking at different frequency combinations. We're looking at uh, different uh, soil moisture, surface soil moisture, and then soil moisture at different uh, depths. We're looking at the incidence angle. We're looking at the polarization. We try to sort of uh, find out the optimal uh, combination of uh, frequencies uh, and angles and polarization and you know, configuration to, to get roots on uh, soil moisture. This is a simulation analysis uh, that we're doing. All right, so far, you know, all I talk about is is you know large scale and then you know space born experiment. Now the, you know it's time come to the uh, your GPS uh, chipset in your phone. So let's just move our attention so from large scale to the you know subfield scales. All right, so this is something you know we came up a couple years ago, and we have been experimenting this uh, at least two years, and we developed some understanding, and still there are a lot of questions we're trying to answer as well. So the idea, this is you can think of like this is like a Cygnus, you know, operating from a drone. So Cygnus is operating from a low Earth orbit, but now this is the the drone version of that. But also the receiver, everybody has a smartphone. And if you have really Android smartphone, so that you can access the raw data, and in this configuration, we place the phone on top of the the drone and bottom of the drone, and we collected the reflected signal over different uh, you know agricultural fields, over um, uh, the ponds, like the over water bodies, over you know different areas. Uh, we call it the data, and we want to understand how this re really reflected signals can be leveraged to get those information. Just want to show you one good example that how you can you know uh, what you can see with what the the phone attached to the drone and the GPS chips in the phone what it can provide you. So you can see here the red uh, line is the flight direction. So the drone is flying from left to right from uh, west to east uh, and passing over the the pond and going over uh, some agricultural field and passing over creek and going another agricultural field uh, on the the east side uh, what you're seeing in here is uh, from one gps satellite only and you think about like i said we have many gps satellites we have many different uh, reflection points on the surface as we move they're moving with us so as the, the run moves those reflected points are also moving as well so the, the blue is showing high reflection, and then the yellow is showing a low reflection. And obviously, the water is, is like a mirror at the microwave frequencies, and it reflects a lot of signal. And you can see that you have a consistent uh, reflection, a high reflection, and then you know goes down and then fluctuates over the agricultural fields and goes over the small creek here, it goes up again, it's not as large as over the pond, but still it goes up and goes down over the grass area and then it fluctuates again. So this itself indicates the how sensitive the smartphone itself, uh, the GPS, um, the chip of the smartphone itself, how sensitive to the water uh, on the surface, right? So this was a good and promising result that we have. But it, uh, of course, nothing is uh, easy. So there are some issues that we have to deal with. One of the issues is that the antenna of the the effect of the antenna. So smartphone antenna is under one dollar, uh, and that works uh, for navigation purposes, but it's a little bit cheap for us, and it's a little bit uh, bad quality for the purpose that we're doing. So what we did is we put the smartphone on a pan tilt mechanism, as you can see in this picture, and we rotated the rotated uh, uh, the the phone in different azimuth and Field angles. Uh, these are sort of, you know, simulating the drone's roll, pitch, and yaw angles. You can think of that way because as the drone moves, because of the wind, as it turns, you know, all these angles may change. So you want to understand really the angular effect. So we run this experiment four different days with two different phones, and then we compare them. So first, this uh, let me just show you uh, the circle, uh, the figure that you're seeing on the top right. That shows you the signal strength as a function of azimuth and elevation. And you can see it's highly variable. Like this is we also observed with another other experiment that we've done. 
So this is a bad news. It's very uh, you know irregular antenna pattern it has. But this experiment that we've done for different days with two phones, we want to see how correlated these are with each other. So the, the one on the, the right bottom that you're seeing is the, the correlation, particularly higher elevation angles. Uh, these are very, very correlated with each other. And the RMSE between two measurements are going below one dB. So what does this tell us? Well, what this tells us is the antenna pattern is irregular, but it's time invariant. So over time, the antenna pattern really doesn't change. So once you characterize the antenna pattern of the smartphone, you should be able to correct in theory and, and considering the orientation changes. So there's a bad news and good news here. So it's sort of bland. And then second, we want to check how the chipset of the smartphone, how the, what is the quality, how good it is. So we, you know, we have a high quality GPS unit. You're seeing this octocopter. It's a, it's a quite expensive system uh, and it's providing the full band information and it's, it's better quality. So we, you know, we've fl you know, flown the, these two drone information uh, and, you know, over the same, uh, same flight uh, plan and we want to compare them. So how the smartphone compares to this high quality receiver. And you can see the, the right figure on you know, this image on the right, you can see the start and the stop. So it goes to north and turns around the, the pond and comes back to the uh, south location. So during that time frame, we compare the uh, custom receiver, that's expensive receiver, good quality with the, the smartphone. And the comparison shows a good correlation. It's you know moderate co correlation at least, like 0 0.69 for this type of uh, experiment that we've done. And we repeated you know similar experiment in different times as well. It's sort of consistent result that we got. So what does this tell us is that uh, the GPS uh, chips in in your smartphone has a good quality, uh, like a you know the the custom receiver that we use that we've flown, it's a very good quality. The problem that we're having is just the antenna itself, right? Uh, but this is a good news here that the GPS is, uh, the chips in your phone is already providing a good uh, SNR information that we, we're looking for. All right, and then, you know, we want to also look at the repeatability. So how can we really repeat this experiment throughout the, uh, in over two days and different time of the day? So we run experiment uh, three times a day and two, uh, and two days. And then we just want to compare smartphone to smartphone. This is not smartphone, the, the custom receiver, smartphone to smartphone. When we do this comparison, again, we, get, we saw a good correlation, 83%, 89 and 93 correlation for this particular experiment that we have. And this indicates that it's repeatable. So that's a good news as well. So you, you make a measurement today and a month later you do a similar measurement so your system is, is quite repeatable. So then that means the only change you're looking for is the change happening on the ground. So that's a good news uh, from a smartphone a GNSSR technique. Um, so, uh, so what is the really goal? You know, all right, so we have the good sensitivity and all, uh, uh, but just wanna show you the coverage. Uh, for example, the, the one on the left, we have, uh, five to six uh, GPS satellites collected at the same time uh, and laid on the, the background image uh, on the, the one, the, the picture on the left, it's a 12 minute coverage. So in 12 minutes, it has a pretty good coverage of this area. This is a fairly large area. It's not really small. We do this with a small uh, quadcopter. So it shows that, you know, it's a really good coverage that you can get uh, using the just the reflected GPS signals in 12 minutes. So you're going to have the soil moisture map over, you know, in 12 minutes, which will be a, a great, you know, um, advancement. But like case of the signals, remember the signals case, we compare our product with this map, which is the state of the art. But here in the field experiment, we don't have this map or anything. We have to develop our own, you know, validation uh, methodology. So this is ongoing. So it's not really finished. So we are developing some rover-based 
So we put, we're putting uh, soil moisture sensors to the rovers. They are going, you know, between the, they're, they're going to go to between the fields and going to measure the actual soil moisture values. The, this is the cartoon explained on the right. And so that we can compare what we're measuring with the smartphone and what really measured with the, you know, actually with the, the rover on the ground. That way we can validate our product and we can say, this is the soil moisture map that you have. And in 12 minutes, it is done. And this is something you cannot really do it using a multispectral thermal camera if there's really vegetation. Uh, because it, like I said, very beginning of my talk, they can only see the surface. They cannot really see inside of the surface or inside the, the vegetation. All right, I, I'm coming near the end of my talk. Just gonna give you one more example. and. And then I'm gonna, you know, finish my talk with the microwave uh, farm concepts. So recently, also we involved with the SMAP uh, science team, uh, and they wanna, you know, build their models uh, across the, the forested areas. Uh, and uh, and SMAP is has a 36 kilometer by 36 kilometer area, it's just giving you a single number, brightness, temperature, um, and you need to characterize the full footprint. An existing approach you're seeing on the right, you cut down a vegetation and you characterize it, uh, and then you provide those into your models, and then you make sort of a prediction and compare with this map, which is, you can see that if you have a 36 kilometer by 36 kilometer area, uh, you can see how feasible it is, right? So how time consuming it is, but that's the existing approach at the moment. So what we propose, what we propose is, again, the GPS signals. We just said, why don't we put a GPS on, uh, smartphone just uh, outside of an uh, open area and why don't we put the, the the smartphone on top of a helmet just walk through the uh, the forest canopy and the difference between what you're measuring under the forest and open area should kind of give you the transmissivity they're looking for and this way you can cover really large areas so uh, you, you're just seeing an example on the left the the bottom is, is where the uh, the graduate student Mehedi, he he walked through the uh, the forest area just behind the HPC building, behind the calves, uh, and and he has a smartphone on top of his helmet, and this is the the heat map that that you generate from there, um, which you're not cutting any trees or anything, but it's just going to give you the transmissivity, how dense the vegetation itself. Well, we said, well, uh, this is not really um, comfortable to put that large. Uh, gimbal on top of your helmet. So we said, well, why don't we just put onto uh, a rover and repeat the same thing? So this is also ongoing. And because of the pandemic, so we were a, we were supposed to join the, the, the validation effort this summer, the past summer, but it was postponed to the next summer. So we hope to join those validation effort with our you know, methodology here so that we can cover large areas and provide them a transmissivity heat maps. All right. so. The final remarks. All right, so I just give you a you know small uh, piece of the puzzle, uh, like the GPS satellites, uh, and a little bit about the P-band uh, uh, data that I just showed you. But if you look, if you think about it, the space, uh, you know, you have a, a lot of satellites uh, at, it, and operates at different frequencies, and particularly this new space infrastructure, the commercialization or democratization of the space. Now the uh, the commercial companies are also launching their satellites to the space. Thousands of the sat satellites. Think about the SpaceX, the Starlink. So going to have more than ten thousand satellites, uh, and there are already thousands of satellites exist uh, orbiting around the uh, the Earth as well, and they're operating at different frequencies. So the future that I see is uh, we can develop small receivers that we can attach to the UAVs those UAVs can collect the reflected signals coming from those free sources. And, and then those reflected signals, depending on the frequency, we're gonna come at different portion of the, the crop, different portion of the, the soil, so that we can combine all of those together and then we can get a more complete picture of the cropland and we can get a more complete picture of the water in the vegetation and water in the soil. Um, with that, thank you so much. Um, for listening to my talk.